my Frans for a toy. It's been a while since I've uploaded uh, some content on, on YouTube. Um, I've been busy around the house and uh, all this uh, lockdown stuff that's uh, preventing us from going wherever we want to go. It's, uh, it's not the ideal situation, but uh, yeah, um, we're all still healthy and still alive. So uh, I thought it's Friday afternoon, there's a hard week behind, uh, behind us. So uh, let's start a nice uh, weekend project. Um, what I had in mind was uh, in my entertainment area, I normally use a small uh, cooler box on top of the countertop if we pour some drinks or things like that. And uh, I want something a bit more appealing to the eye than just a styrofoam or a plastic cooler box on top of the countertop. So I thought uh, I might build myself a nice wooden uh, ice bucket or a cooler box, what you want to call it. And uh, yeah, I think it will be a nice fun project. So what I had in mind was uh, not a really big, maybe 350 millimeters by 250 millimeters and uh, maybe 250 millimeters high. And I will line the, the cooler box also with some ISO board on the inside. So here in, in Centurion, there's a company called ISO board. So uh, I went over there and I talked to the guys there. They were very helpful. And uh, they suggested the thinnest insulation that they have. There is a 25 millimeter ISO board. It's basically an extruded uh, polystyrene. It's 100% waterproof. Uh, it's very good insulation. So the 25 millimeter ISO board will give you more or less the same insulation as a 50 millimeter or to 60 millimeter uh, normal styrofoam as we know it. Uh, the one with the small balls that's compact together. So this ISO board has got a really smooth uh, surface on it. Uh, it doesn't need any painting on the inside or finishing on the on the inside so I could just glue it with some silicone directly to the wood and all the corners I can seal up with normal uh, silicone and uh, yeah it uh, doesn't look too difficult. So the wood that I decided on that I would use is uh, called Rhodesian Teak. Um, it's a very popular wood under, under woodworkers here in South Africa. There's two different markets also also for Rhodesian Teak. There's old used uh, railway sleepers that is very popular and there's uh, lots of them available for making rustic furniture and then also you have your um, your fresh on uh, wood as well so a lot of the people think there's a big stigma behind reduction teak and uh, it blunts your tools uh, really quickly if you work with railway sleepers yes it does but it's not the wood as such that uh, that's got the blunting effect it is harder than uh, the, some of your other teak species but uh, the big thing that influences um, uh, the sharpness or the weight on your tools when you're working with railway sleepers is all the dust and all the sand that's, uh, that's caught in the cavities on the wood. And that damages your, your tools uh, quite severely. So your planer blades will get blunt very quickly. Your, your saw blades will get blunt very quickly. And uh, that's basically the reason why there's a stigma that uh, railway sleepers or addition teak is, is a really hard wood. If you work with a, a, a fresh sawn wood, it's a totally different experience that you have. So, all the railway sleepers originated, uh, they were busy building a railway line uh, between Francis Town and Victoria Falls in uh, Old Rhodesia, today called Zimbabwe. So, it was built by a British South African company. And they used to import and manufacture a lot of steel sleepers that they put underneath the railways. And it was really difficult to transport and it was really heavy. So they started to experiment with, uh, with wood sleepers. And uh, th that's when they started using a reduction tea. You can find that the tea is a really, really hard tree and it's a tough tree. And it was glowing plenty of them in the northwestern parts of, of Zimbabwe. So the trees were already there. So... Uh, it was easy for them to chop down a tree, uh, start uh, cutting the lumber into sleepers and to uh, use them directly. There was no need for, for transportation for hundreds of miles. And uh, yeah, that's, that, that's why the reduction teak become that popular and that's why there's a lot of sleepers available today. So they were harvesting those trees uh, uncontrollably, I would say between 1908 to 1925 to 1930. And then uh, they started putting a ban on, on cutting down reduction teak trees. Um, actually, they, they handed out a quota each year on how much trees um, can be removed from the natural forest. And they also put a plan in place to replant some of those trees. So the reduction teak tree normally goes uh, 25 to 30 meters high. I've heard of some trees, uh, the, the stem of the tree 
that uh, reaches 1.5 to 1.8 meters in diameter. That's really big trees. I doubt that there's any of those trees left today. And, uh, and in the 1970s to 80s, they replaced those railway sleepers, uh, the Rhodesian Teak railway sleepers, with concrete sleepers. So even still today, they are replacing old wooden railway sleepers with concrete sleepers. That's why there's a lot of uh, railway sleepers available to, to our woodworkers to, to, to build some furniture of that. So the tree, here's a sample of the wood you will see. It's, uh, it's quite an appealing look to the, to the wood. It's got a yellowish uh, appearance with all these uh, dark streaks. Some of them uh, actually can become a, a dark brown or black. And, uh, and the wood is also really stable. So it's not uh, known for, for warping a lot when it gets wet or, or moist. As I'm building a cooler box, it will get wet from time to time or it will be exposed uh, to moist. Even though I will put a uh, well finish on it, which is actually not ideal for, for surfaces that get uh, exposed to moist a lot. But I like the Danish oil a lot. And I think if you put uh, three or four proper coats on there, it's a uh, sufficient sealant for, for the wood. So yeah, let's uh, get to cutting the lumber. And uh, I hope you enjoy this, uh, this journey with me with building this uh, small ice bucket. Thanks for the guys that have subscribed this far. I really appreciate it a lot. And if you like the video, please click the like button down below. And uh, let me know you like the video, yes. If you have any comments, please put them down in the description below. And I always read the comments and uh, I do like to engage in some conversations with you guys. So, yeah, let's get on with it and uh, I hope you enjoy it. of wood together like this. I will put some glue in the biscuit grooves as well. There I have a little bit of movement. So at this point it's uh, easy to remove the squeeze out with just a normal scraper. 
So uh, I flattened the front piece of, uh, of the putty knife so it acts as a scraper. So I have two very sharp edges on the side and uh, you will see it removes the excess glue really easy and clean and uh, this helps a lot later on uh, with the finishing to remove the squeeze out now it's just so it's the next day it's about uh, 15 18 hours later so the glue uh, looks dry so we can remove all the clamps all the lumber is out of the clamps now so you will see where the clamps ran there's a little bit of glue uh, that dried on the surface and uh, on this side as well if you can get a close up there so it's quite high and this will uh, with this will have a significant impact on, on the height uh, when you when you put it through the planer so it's important to look for any high spots any glue that dried so just remove them before you put it through the planer See why I like removing the glue before it dries. It's much easier. So I've made a drawing of the um, ice box that I want to build. It just uh, makes things a little bit easier. So you guys remember when I put the, the biscuits into the wood. So that's one thing that I perhaps forgot to say. I marked them out so that if I cut all the panels, all the components of the, of the cooler box, that I will not cut into the biscuits. But even though if you cut into the biscuits, it won't be a big trench match because there is uh, 45 mitres on all the joints. So they will be hidden in any case. So to make things a little bit more organized, I'm just going to mark the pieces of wood. So this piece I'm going to divide into three pieces. So let's say this is the front. And uh, this I want the lid. The wood looks nice here, so I think it would make a nice lid. This will be the back part. And this will be the bottom. And this one is also going to be split in half, so we can make this uh, left and uh, this one right. So let's go to the mitre saw, cut them up in, uh, in manageable, more manageable pieces. Is, uh, it's cut to size, so now we're going to do the, the 45 mitres on the edges. So keep the wood when you lay it out like this, keep them in the same orientation. So you can just mark them one, two, three, four. And to make things easier for yourself, also you can mark your 45s the angle on which you should cut them. You can mark them now so that you don't make any faults on your, on your mitre saw. So before I cut my uh, 45 mitres, I'm just going to switch out my uh, blade guide. This, this is the zero clearance blade guide with the standard blade guide. Otherwise, uh, you will be cutting into it and you won't have a zero clearance again. You have to redo it. it takes two to three minutes to change it. It's very quick. And. Uh, if your uh, zero clearance blade guide gets cut up, you can make a new one afterwards. But uh, if I cut my test, I just replace mine with the standard ones and uh, that prevents any, any damage to, it, to them.
So all the 45s are cut on, uh, on the edges of the cooler box and uh, they came out quite nicely. So uh, let's quickly clamp them. So first I'm going to take some, um, um, some blue tape. It's a bit stronger than the, the normal uh, masking tape. And I'm just going to tape all the, the corners together. And uh, that helps you to keep uh, everything nice and straight. And then afterwards, I'm, uh, I have two ratchet straps. I'm going to clamp them with the ratchet straps. It's a very simple, simple way to, to clamp it. There's a few different ways that you can clamp these, uh, these mitre joints. It's not always uh, the easiest um, joint to clamp. Yeah, so all the corners are, are close to perfect. Just uh, want to glue the bottoms as well. Yeah, so I'm happy with the way the, the corners look. The box is sitting nice and flat, it's flush. So yeah, let's uh, start the glue up and uh, I will show you how. First thing, uh, let's check uh, with the square. How good the corners look. That's perfect. That's perfect. So if you if you measure your corners and uh, you are a bit off, you can decide if you want to leave it like that and uh, you just cut a little little bit skew, or you will have to recut all the mitres on the side to see if you can't get it better. But uh, this is this is really perfect. Uh, let me show you closer. So here you can see you have a perfect uh, a perfect mitre here in the corner. That's what you're looking for. So before I start with the glue up, I just lay my ratchet straps out on the desk and I move them underneath my project. It's always a good idea to, to get everything ready before you apply the glue. So uh, my straps are, are ready. So now I just remove them like this. I open one side of the box. Oops. And then I fold the whole box open. Like this. I'm going to use my uh, my favorite glue, it's the Sponal. It's a really strong glue and it never let me down. Uh, perhaps just to show you, you've seen that uh, um, the biscuits that I've put in here. So if you measure it out properly, all the biscuits is nicely. So there's three in this piece, there's two in this piece, three in this one as well. And two in that one as well. So that makes this joint really strong. And it's easier also to get your alignment uh, properly before you are clamping the boards like this. So uh, let's put uh, enough glue. So remember this is an end grain uh, joint over here. And the end grain uh, takes a lot more wood glue than uh, the face grain like this would take. So uh, the end grain is uh, it, it's much thirstier and it drops a lot of glue. So uh, don't be shy with adding adding glue. When you have your, your glue up uh, finished, you can always remove the excess glue. But yeah, don't be shy with, uh, with putting glue on here. Also with the tape that you put uh, underneath, it keeps the, the edges nice and tight so you don't have any spillage of glue on your workbench or your working surface. So you get uh, special corner clamps that you can use to, to, to clamp your mitre joints. But uh, I've never tried them before. I'm always using uh, normal ratchet straps and uh, I've been using that for many years and uh, it works good for me. So the nice thing now with the, with the tape that you used, everything just fold up. Um, really nice, like a, like a hinge. Very simple and easy. 
You bring your last edge uh, together. So uh, it's moving around quite a lot now. The glue is uh, is very slippery. on like that bring in my first uh, strap Second strap. So when your mitis is uh, is cut properly, uh, as soon as you put some pressure on this box, the whole box will, will will square it out itself. It's a good thing just to make sure with your with your square. So I lift the ratchet strap just a little bit up. Just a little bit of pressure. Also just a little bit of pressure. So check that all the corners are nicely aligned, which they are. So then I'm going to add more pressure. I think that will be enough. Last check for, for squareness. It's nice and square. Nice and square. So I'm just going to wipe off some of the excess glue. So I'm happy with the way uh, it came out. You'll see on the inside uh, I've got a lot of uh, glue squeeze out in the corners. So I'm going to remove that with my uh, scraper. I see there's a lot of people that use a wet rag to remove uh, the wet glue. So uh, they take a normal uh, cotton or a wet rag and they wipe the glue off. I've tried it before, it, it works quite good. Uh, it's not as tacky and messy as uh, working with the glue dry. But the problem I, I have with that is, the moment when you wet the glue, you tend to thin the glue a lot and you spread it on the side of your, of your joint and it, and it uh, seeps into the wood. And uh, when you sand it, you don't see it. But as soon as you put an oil or a sealer on there, the, uh, where the wood glue um, uh, was absorbed by the wood itself, your oil is not getting absorbed in that area as good as, as on the rest on the, on the wood. Uh, the same with varnish. So we will always sit with a color difference where your, um, where your glue was spread and absorbed by the wood itself. So uh, I find it easier just to scrape it off right now. Uh, every glue that I can see that's very visible, remove as much as possible of it. And then uh, just a quick sand and it's less than a mess. Uh, when you try removing it with a wet rag. So while I'm waiting for the for the sides to dry, I'm gonna um, install the base uh, so long. This will also help keep the structure uh, nice together when I when I remove the, the ratchet strap. So the traps are now about uh, let's say about an half an hour. I'm gonna leave them for uh, perhaps two hours or so. Then I'm gonna remove them. Um, so the, the base I'm going to attach uh, using a normal wood screws, um, 4 millimeters by 50 millimeters long. And I'm going to countersink them and on top of the screws I will just add a dowel to, to give a nice finish. Um, the screws is actually just uh, to save a little bit of time. So I'm going to glue the bottom on as well so the screws will keep it nice and uh, 
and sturdy while the glue is drying. So even though it is uh, normal steel screws, if it gets wet, it, it, it will rust at some point. But I'm going to seal the, the, the box on the inside so it's not supposed to get wet or, or any water inside. So uh, yeah, let's start uh, assembling the, uh, the base. So once again I'm removing all the squares out while the glue is still wet and then the uh, problem that I ran into it, uh, it turns out my 10 millimeter dowels is, uh, is actually 9 millimeter dowel and not a 10 millimeter so I've already drilled the holes to 9.5 millimeter and when I took the 10 millimeter dowel and measured it uh, it measures at 9 millimeter so I'm going to add the dowels at the later stage. I'm not going to wait uh, or, or struggle now to get uh, to get dowels. So uh, it just needs a little bit of sanding to get it perfectly flush. There's about a half a millimeter, I would say, uh, uh, overlap here. So it's not a lot of overlap. So I'm just going to sand that off quickly and then continue with the isolation I want to uh, install on the inside. So I'm done with the sanding now. Um, the mitre joints came out really nice. Uh, I'm pleased with that. So now it's time to fit the lid. So uh, the lid looks alright. It's about uh, a quarter of a millimeter Overhang perhaps a little bit less. I'm not going to remove that. I'm not going to worry about that too much So the hinges that I want to use Are these uh, normal cabinet uh, cabinet hinges. So it's a soft close hinge So when you close the lid it will go down really smoothly. It's got like a small uh, hydraulic cylinder on the inside um, Perhaps I can show you So this is a close-up of that uh, soft close hinge. You will see on the inside. There's a small um, hydraulic cylinder and they work really nice they are quite strong and also very cheap so the height of the hinges looks about alright but I see one of the the problem that I have is when I open the door, this back side of the door is rubbing against the, um, the body of the cooler box. So uh, we will need just to, to put a small 45 chamfer um, on this back side to, to make some space for, for the door when it opens and it closes. I'm going to do that on my, uh, on my router. There's already a 45 bit in there. So let's quickly put that 45 on there. Nice and centered. So the inch needs to move a little bit backwards here on the front. It's got a little bit of overhang. 
So I'm going to start lining the cooler box now with, uh, with this ISO board. You can see here it's uh, it's more solid than the than the uh, normal polystyrene that uh, most of us are familiar with, and it's got a really smooth uh, finish on top. These ones are a little bit uh, scratched and small dents in there, but uh, I got them for free, so I'm not going to worry about that. So yeah, let's start cutting that on the table saw. So the last piece that needs to fit, uh, needs to go into the lid. We'll still figure out how I'm going to do that. But uh, it's already fitting into the hole. But I think to make it a little bit easier, I'm going to put a, let's say perhaps a 8 or a 10 degree bevel on all four sides, just to make it uh, seat a little bit easier. And uh, then I will find a way to glue it uh, onto the lid. So I uh, put it on a 15 degree bevel. I'm gonna um, push it in like this and I'm gonna put a little bit of super glue on top with the activator here and then I'm gonna close it and uh, hopefully it will stick to the lid. Looks like it will work. Let's hope for the best. Do you get a few seconds? Perfect. So I decided not to stick the styrofoam against the side, they are quite uh, firm and sturdy, so if they get damaged and I need to replace them in the future, um, uh, I can break them out uh, easier. So the silicone that I will put in the corners uh, will hold them together nicely, so I'm just going to go with, uh, with the silicone on the corners. So I have all the corners uh, sealed. Now I just want to put a layer of uh, oil on top and the handle and uh, then it's ready for action. So this is a few hours later, um, the silicone has, uh, has dried in the corners and uh, all the styrofoam is, uh, is quite sturdy. So I'm pleased with, uh, with the way that came out. It's perhaps still a little bit tacky but uh, it will take a day or two to, to dry up properly. So next thing I want to do is uh, I want to install some handles. I'm going to use uh, normal uh, cabinet handles, one on each side and one on the top to open the handle with. So uh, let me show you how I install uh, these handles. So to install these uh, cabinet handles, uh, I need to remove the heads of the screws. So I quickly going to take my hacksaw and just uh, chop them off. So I have this uh, steel vise that I uh, store up there. Makes it a bit easier than uh, the, the carpentry vise. If you have to cut uh, small pieces of steel. So the carpentry vise is real sturdy in my, in my workbench. So uh, even though this is a vise within a vise, it's, uh, it's really solid. And there's very little movement. And it makes uh, cutting and things like that uh, a bit more easier for me. So to sharpen the, the heads of the screws, I just uh, put them in my battery drill. 
Nice and sharp. So after the small screws are sharpened, I'm going to insert them into the handle. So I just take a little bit of uh, super glue. You can use a uh, Loctite or thread, thread locking uh, glue as well. Doesn't matter. Then uh, I'll put the screw in. I would say perhaps uh, um, one third of the way. Don't drop it. Something like that. Let's do the other one. It will perhaps be better to use a little bit uh, uh, more longer screws. Unfortunately, this is the ones that I have that came with the handles, but uh, it will work. And then I just take this uh, activator. And that's the story. So now decide on uh, where I want to put it. I'm not going to measure it out, I'm just going to... Uh, Go with, with the eye, bump it slightly, so the sharp, uh, the two sharp points on the screws will make uh, some nice marks for you on where to drill the holes. So I'm gonna... And then to insert the handle, I just take uh, another drop of uh, super glue. Then I take my handle So it's a 4mm screw and the holes that I drilled it's a 3.5mm so they go in quite snug and uh, I doubt that this handle will, will go anywhere. So let's uh, quickly finish the, the handle on the lid and on the other side. And then uh, I think also on the edges here, yeah, the edges is really sharp. Perhaps I think I'm going to do a, a small uh, 45 chamfer. And uh, I'm going to do that with my small uh, palm router. So the router bit that I'm using, it's a normal 45 degree uh, chamfer bit with uh, the bearing for the guide on the side. So let's uh, quickly cut the chamfers on. So what's left to do now is just to, to sand all the edges. So uh, I use a, just a normal piece of scrap wood that I put some 400 grit uh, sandpaper on there. And you can hold it easily against that uh, 45 angle. And you can give it a real nice finish. If there's a, a slight burr as well from, from the router, you just go over the corner like this and it's gone. Now it's time for um, to add the Danish weld. So just remove all the dust. So the Danish oil that I'm going to use is uh, this one from uh, uh, Watko. I've been using this for for many years. Um, it's a good Danish oil, 
You can also mix your own Danish oil. It's uh, it's quite easy. It's uh, one third uh, mineral oil turpentine, uh, one third uh, boiled linseed oil, and uh, one third of any polyurethane varnish. You mix them together, and uh, you have uh, the same effect as this uh, Danish oil. So what the polyurethane does when you add the polyurethane, that's a tongue twister. If you add the polyurethane uh, with the boiled linseed oil and your and your thinner, that is uh, turpentine or mineral spirits, is the polyurethane has a, a, a drying agent in it, so it, it helps uh, speeding up the process of drying. If you just put the boiled linseed oil, it will take perhaps two or three days to dry properly. But uh, when you add the polyurethane in your Danish oil, it uh, it speeds up the drying process. So when I put on the oil, you must not be shy. So uh, I will put a decent amount of oil on and let it soak in. Leave it maybe for, for 15 to 20 minutes and then uh, I will remove all the excess oil. Uh, wipe it dry. The next day I will repeat the process again. I will uh, wipe on uh, another coat of Danish oil. Let it soak in for 15 to 20 minutes and then wipe it totally dry. As soon as you start uh, to see there's a lot of build up with uh, all the bold linseed oil that dries out, then you know you have put on too much and to remove that is also quite easy. I just take uh, 600 grit um, um, uh, wet sanding paper, I put some Danish oil on, I will um, sand the whole surface again, uh, wipe it dry and uh, you will have a smooth surface again. So it's uh, very easy to work with the Danish oil. It's a cheap finish and uh, it's a 100% natural uh, look on the wood. It's not as robust as, uh, um, uh, as varnishes that you put on there. But uh, I like the natural uh, the feel of the wood as well. So uh, when you tend to put on a lot of varnish on wood, it tends to look like a glassy surface and uh, it starts looking too plastic to me. So uh, I enjoy putting oil on and uh, I would say 90% of all the furniture that I built, uh, I will finish that with a Danish roll. So the box is uh, finished now. I put on uh, two or three layers of, uh, of Danish roll. It uh, came out uh, very nice. I think it will be a good addition to my entertainment area. Perhaps just, uh, just a small warning. Um, when you apply the Danish roll with a rag, if you throw this in a dustpan or in a confined space, this will catch fire. It will uh, spontaneous combust um, all the fumes and chemicals that's in here. So the safest way to store a rag like this is either lay it out on the floor to dry properly, or what I do if I use it multiple times, I will just put it in a, in a glass jar with a little bit of uh, turpentine inside, and uh, I will seal it up like this. This is safe, you can store it like that. But if you, if you, even the paper that you, that you use to wipe this with, if you put that in a dustbin and uh, it's a, there's not a lot of airflow around it, uh, believe me, it will catch fire. You can look on YouTube, there's a lot of videos and discussions regarding that. So, uh, yeah, perhaps just a word of uh, caution when you're working with Danish oil. So, thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Feel free to leave a comment down below. I always read the comments and I like to engage in some of the discussions with you guys. Important thing when you do mitres, uh, perhaps uh, just uh, something to keep in mind is a lot of people cut their mitres uh, on the table saw, they build it, uh, the sled for the table saw. It's also uh, quite easy to do as well. But uh, after all, a mitre uh, saw is designed to do proper mitre. So if your mitre saw is not dialed in properly, you will struggle to get the real accurate mitres. And, uh, but once you've sorted that out, it's much easier to use for me than, uh, than a table saw. If the mitres is a lot bigger than this, yes, of course, then you will have to do uh, it on the table saw. But uh, uh, my Makita mitre saw that I have can, uh, can cut uh, 305 millimeters of width. And uh, that is, that's more than enough to do drawers or small boxes like this. So yeah, I will see you on the next project. And uh, thank you for watching. And I really hope you enjoyed it. Stay safe out there and uh, I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>